Well, good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to start on time. Um, as any of you that are my patients know, I like to start on time, like get done on time. Um, so, which is kind of rare for a doctor these days, I think. But I, I try. Not every day is perfect, but we try. A um, couple of things. Um, I am not responsible for that title. Um, our media advertising people said that putting osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis on the slide was not sexy enough. So, <laughs> so <coughs> I, that's, I have a complete disclaimer from that. Anyway, my name is Rick Chowell. I'm one of the uh, rheumatologists here at the, at the uh, Arthritis Center of Nebraska. And I wore the suit and tie in honor of my mother, who was going to come, who's 93. But she just didn't feel well at the last minute, so she thought she'd stay home. But uh, if I didn't have a coat and tie on, then I would have heard about it for a week. <laughs> so, but I'm really glad because otherwise she would have been here. Um, and um, I'll never, it just brought back waves of memories. When I, when I first started practice, I'd been in town about a week. And I was getting ready to start my practice. And my mom came and she helped us move into our house. And, and, uh, and she looks at me and she goes, do you have any business cards? And I said, well, well sure, I've, I've got some business cards. She goes, can I have a stack? <laughs> And, and I said, why, why do you want a stack? She goes, I'm going to the mall. I thought, <laughs> I thought, so I, that, is, that is the truth. And so, anyway, I have my lovely daughter here today, so it's nice to, home from college, but anyway. Um, yeah, so that's all my disclaimers for the, for the evening, I think. So anyway, uh, I guess the last disclaimer is, I made this talk very simple, very basic, not to insult your intelligence, but be because this is the kind of talk that brings in a lot of people from all over that some have an extensive amount of knowledge because they've dealt with these issues for many years, or some people are questioning, do I have this, and what does this mean, and, and I don't know where to start. So that's the way this talk is. It's kind of a, let's just kind of get started, and we'll just talk about it. And then if you have questions, we can get deep, as deep as you want to get, but I didn't want to you know, make this too professorial and have it go over everybody's head. So, so we'll go along. Okay. Page up. Maybe it's page down. Ah. Okay, so the objectives tonight are very simple. I really wanted to highlight two different types of arthritis, one rheumatoid arthritis and one osteoarthritis, and it'll become pretty clear to you why I chose those. There's a lot of different types of arthritis, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but I chose those because they are really on opposite ends of the spectrum as far as how they behave pathologically in the body and the manifestations that they have. We'll talk about some traditional therapies and some, some of the newer medicines that you may have heard about. And, and again, at the end of the day, I, I hope it gives you a, a different understanding about what arthritis is, who it affects, how we diagnose it, how we treat it, and those types of things. Okay. So the, the impact of arthritis is um, you hear about morbidity and mortality, everything in the paper about this causes this or this affects our lifespan here or does this there. But arthritis is the leading cause of disability in this country. It does affect all ages. Uh, arthritis can affect toddlers to those uh, in their 90s. So we, have, we can't exclude uh, anybody when we have this discussion. Basically it's one out of six people and then um, um, and about 30% of people in Nebraska, or Nebraska adults, have some form of arthritis, um, especially for the uh, autoimmune diseases. We'll talk about lightly here tonight. Uh, women are affected about twice as often. A lot of the rheumatoid arthritis studies that you'll see when you look at how they break it down, about 66 to 75% of uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis have are women, and the other remainder are men. And, and this cost was basically. Uh, at the early 2000s, so that 65 billion has actually increased uh, rather significantly. Well, what are some of the type? Hi there. Oh, yeah. See, when you come late to church, you got to get the front row. So it's okay. Uh, but anyway, welcome. So um, anyway, some of the myths are that that arthritis is just a part of aging. Well, you know, yes, and well, no. Um, you know, the longer we use our joints, you're going to have some wear and tear, and that typically follows the osteoarthritis path. But there are those people who say, you know, you can't use that excuse for a, a toddler who's, you know, 12 months old, you know, or you can't use it for somebody with juvenile onset inflammatory arthritis that's a teenager. Uh, so it's not just a part of aging either, or that it's not serious. Um, 
Um, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, has uh, an increased risk for mortality, and we, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, in some studies, as much as 10 years shorter because of, of the way that the disease, the inflammatory response that the disease has in the body. We're making some inroads there, I'm glad to say, um, but, but still for many years past, that, that was a big issue for a lot of people. Um, people are often concerned about side effects of medicines. Well, many of the medicines for rheumatoid arthritis, there's been concerns, well, that increased my risk for cancer. But for example, we know certain types of lymphomas, blood cell cancers, the risk for having that condition is three times higher just by having the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis without any type of therapy. So I've often wondered, and the answer, the question's never been answered to me is that, okay, if we have somebody that with rheumatoid arthritis and we do get them under excellent control, do we actually reduce their cancer risk? The answer to that's still pending. And then, you know, is nothing can be done for arthritis. And I hear that a lot. And the scary part is I hear that from a lot of doctors, okay? Um, I, I think in this day and age, I think one of the more common reasons is that doctors are just too busy. I mean, your family doctor is worrying about your blood pressure and your diabetes and, and, and your weight and all those other kinds of things. And when it, when it finally gets down to the issue of, of uh, arthritis, they kind of go, oh, well, it's just arthritis and, you know, take two time, I'll call me in the morning kind of thing. Um, the other thing that was very interesting, there's a really elegant study that was done about 20 years ago looking at this issue. They interviewed a bunch of patients before they went into the, the doctor's office and they had them fill out a form, what are your primary concerns, okay? And then they interviewed the doctor and they said, well, what were your primary concerns for this patient visit? And the interesting thing was when you look at the list, they were like that. <laughs> you know, the patient came in complaining, I'm worried about my knee pain or how am I going to be able to do this, that, and the other. And, and the doctor was worrying about, okay, well, what's her blood pressure or, or lipids or whatever like that. So sometimes the issue about arthritis gets put on the back burner. So I guess that, that's why there are people like me. Okay. So well, what are the warning signs? Um, because again, arthritis is a very common, very common condition. The things I look for, especially when I'm trying to sort out, is this an autoimmune or systemic type of disease is, have, do they have symptoms for, for more than six weeks, okay? If you have persistent symptoms for more than six weeks, that, that's a red flag. If you have unexplained fever, weight loss, or if it starts to interfere with your activities of daily living, those are the kinds of things I need to hear about. If you wake up at night because your joints are hurting, that's a concern that needs to be addressed. Now, it may not be anything serious, but it still needs to be addressed, and those are the warning signs that we have. Okay. So, there's a lot of different types of arthritis, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk through some of these, but you can see just in this list, I mean, this represents, you know, about, you know, six different ones here, and uh, this is an old pie chart looking at, you know, 15.8 uh, million people uh, in the country. It's, it's closer to 40. Okay. Okay. So what are the, what are the differences? Okay, so when I, when I looked at these two particular um, diseases, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, I, I looked at, okay, what's the difference? So which one's, you know, chronic versus acute or long-standing versus sudden, uh, inflammatory versus degenerative or wear and tear, okay? Generalized involvement of the joints or very localized enjoyment of all, say, one knee versus both hands and both feet and both knees, and, okay? And then a systemic illness versus one confined to the joint. Uh, there are over 100 different types of arthritis, and, and usually when you're looking at the arthritis diagnosis that we use, we usually base it upon how the arthritis is characterized, what joints it hits, how it's involved. But there are a significant number of arthritis that have systemic or body-wide inflammatory responses that go along with the arthritis. Okay. And again, joint disease must be, the last one, joint disease must be distinguished from an old term, rheumatism, which just means musculoskeletal pain, uh, or chronic pain like, like fibromyalgia. Okay. So when you look at this, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic inflammatory autoimmune condition. So it's the immune system run amok, okay? It's a chronic condition. It's very inflammatory. It can affect areas outside the joints, so it's considered generalized or systemic, and, and it can affect basically any 
uh, diarthrodial joint, which is a fancy way of saying any joint that's covered with a joint capsule. So basically, it's any peripheral joint from the shoulders on down, okay? And, but only one place in the entire spine, the C12 level at, at the base of the skull. There's only one, one area in the entire spine that rheumatoid arthritis can involve, and that's between the first and second uh, cervical vertebrae. And the reason is that's the only joint in the spine that's actually lined by a joint capsule or synovium. Okay. Then osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is, again, a chronic condition. It's degenerative. It's the wear and tear type of arthritis, the ones that we all tend to get as we get a little bit older. Okay. Um, and it can be generalized, but oftentimes for most patients it's characterized by one or two particularly troublesome joints. The, the knees or the hips are very, are very common. Sometimes the hands, especially in ladies, they can get kind of knobby, and that can be a real problem for them. Usually that ends up being more than just, uh, it tends to be more of a nuisance than one that, that dramatically limits their functional activity, say for example, as compared to rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it doesn't mean they don't have to make adaptations in their lifestyle or do things different, but it's not a, a, as crippling as say rheumatoid hand involvement. And then fibromyalgia is a chronic musculoskeletal pain condition. Uh, it doesn't affect the joints per se. It's more the soft tissues, <clears throat> and it can be very global, basically from, from here all the way down to the feet, uh, often associated with uh, significant uh, uh, sleep disturbances and fatigue as well. Okay. So the definition, again, it's a chronic systemic inflammatory disease. Again, one of the paradigms or one of the hallmark features for rheumatoid arthritis, and one I really try to adhere to, is people have to have persistent joint swelling in the same joint for a minimum of six weeks. And why do I, why do I stick to that? And the reason I do is because we're very good now at diagnosing rheumatoid disease uh, because of the clinical presentation with some of the other things we have to rely on, lab tests, x-rays, things like that. Not that those testing in and of themselves make the diagnosis, but it's the whole thing combined. But the reason we do that is probably because 10% of people will get a blast of rheumatoid arthritis. It will last a defined period of time, usually a matter of weeks, and may completely go away and never rear its head again. And so what I don't want to do in my, in my own estimation is I don't want to put everybody that I diagnose with rheumatoid arthritis therapy on therapy until I'm convinced it's not going to go away unless I do something about it. Because I try to give it every opportunity to go away on its own, and if it does, then hallelujah, and if it doesn't, then we'll get after it. Okay? So one hour morning stiffness is a very common thing. Uh, people with osteoarthritis tend to have, they tend to feel their best in the morning. They may have a little stiffness when they first get out of bed, but generally they feel their best in the morning, and their pain discomfort gets worse over time as the day goes on. With rheumatoid arthritis, it's the opposite. A profound amount of morning stiffness, at least an hour in most cases. And actually, as the day goes on, as they get moving and get working and doing things, they actually improve. Okay? And then as, as evening sets in, they start to get stiff again, they slow down, and things happen. Okay? Um, so it's symmetrical. That's important. Um, it's symmetrical because it can affect both sides of the body evenly. So you know, these joints as well as these joints, the elbows, the wrists, the knees, whereas osteoarthritis is much more um, uh, asymmetric. You get a little bit on this side, a little bit on that side. Um, a positive rheumatoid factor. That's a common thing. I see this a lot. Uh, people come in for an evaluation because their doctor checked their rheumatoid factor. And that's an important thing. Um, about 1% about of the population will have rheumatoid arthritis. What's important to know is that 5% of the population, and most of those who will never get rheumatoid arthritis, have a positive blood test. So you have 1% of the population with actual rheumatoid disease, and 5% of the population have a positive rheumatoid blood test. Okay? So if I were to treat them all, then I'd be treating 80% of the people that don't have rheumatoid arthritis. The other thing is, is that 80% of people with rheumatoid arthritis will ultimately develop a positive rheumatoid factor, okay? Maybe not initially, but eventually, okay? So the problem with that scenario is that 20% of people with classical rheumatoid arthritis never get a positive blood test, okay? So I can't use the blood test as the sole criteria for making the diagnosis, and neither should your family doctor. So, <clears throat> but 
anyway, so that's what you look at. But again, if it's there, it's a helpful, it's a helpful thing to see. Okay. And then of course, rheumatoid arthritis, one of the big concerns about it primarily is that it is an erosive condition. It does destroy the joints. And sometimes I will run across people, people that come in, they have significant rheumatoid arthritis. They see the treatment options, they get scared about the potential side effects, not actual side effects, but the potential for side effects. And I don't want to make light of that. I mean, you know, when you're looking at that stuff yourself going, why do I want to take this drug when this can do X, Y, Z to me? You know, that's, uh, you know I, I get that. But the problem is not doing something is also making a decision. And the decision is failing to do something now is going to affect you, how you're going to be 10 and 20 years down the road, okay? Now, <clears throat> if you're a woman, who, which most of them are, and it, and it hits you in the typical age group, which is childbearing, okay, you know, 20s and 30s, okay, 10 and 20 years down the road is significant. It's hard to, it's hard to look at that, but you know, those people are going to become 30 and 40 and 50. They don't think so at the time because they're going to be forever young. Um, but you know, that's part of my job is to try to tell them, I'm treating not just today, I'm treating the future. And, uh, and if you don't do something about it, I know where this is heading. Okay. Okay. Um, we talked about this already, 1% of the population, peak ages typically uh, for childbearing years. Uh, prevalence does continue to arise with age. There are people after, uh, later in life, after menopause, or males later in life, they get that as well. But still the ratio is about three to one, males to female, or females to males. And predictors of severe disease are those who have really high inflammatory markers, which is called an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or SED rate, <clears throat> an older age of onset, a positive rheumatoid factor, and people that have extra articular manifestations, like rheumatoid nodules, um, erosive disease on their x-ray, okay, lung involvement, that type of thing, because rheumatoid arthritis can involve the lung. Okay. Okay. So here are some other clinical features. We talked about the inflammatory arthritis. We talked about some of the constitutional features. When people first come in, they can have fevers, um, a loss of appetite, uh, weight loss, things like that. Okay. And then the, 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 the extra articular symptoms. The Sjogren's syndrome, that's dry eyes and dry mouth that can happen with this condition. Xerostomia is dry mouth. KSC is keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis sicca, which is dry eyes. It can affect the blood vessels, um, and that's referred to as the vasculitis. It can cause uh, a fluid collections around the lungs, sometimes pleurisy or pleural effusions. Uh, can affect the, the heart and lungs as well. Um, cause lung disease, and, and on rare occasions, it can also involve the nervous system. Okay. So <clears throat> when I first see people with rheumatoid arthritis, this is what I usually see on the left side. <clears throat> this is what's referred to as fusiform swelling, uh, where it just kind of looks like a swollen pipe, uh, but the swelling is predominantly around the joints. The, the PIP joints are very classic. The proximal interphalangeal joints. Rheumatoid loves the metacarpal phalangeal joint, the big knuckles. It loves the PIP joints, and only rarely involves the distal or DIP joints. Okay. Now, what we see over time is that we start to see subluxation of the joints, where, where the finger joints, as they connect to the hand, instead of lining up like that, they start to they start to tuck under, and you get that's what we refer to as subluxation. Okay. And then with that, with the tendon pull, because the tendon forces clasping the hands tend to drive the fingers laterally, we start to see this ulnar deviation or the sweeping laterally of the hands, okay? <clears throat> and what you can see in this particular woman is you can see these little nodules that are sticking up. Those are, those are rheumatoid nodules. Okay. But what I want to do is I want to treat this so that this is better and it doesn't get to this point. And we're doing a better job of that with the advent of newer medicines, probably since the 1990s, a real renaissance in the treatment of rheumatoid disease. Okay, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite slides of all time on the left, uh, because this shows the same joint over time, okay? And what you'll see here, you see the joint space, the joint space has cartilage in it, okay? Cartilage doesn't have any calcium in it, so when you shoot an x-ray through it, it looks invisible, okay? But we know there's cartilage there because 
if there were no cartilage, the bones would just be sticking bone on bone, okay? And so what you'll see in here, over time, you start to see more inflammation. The bone gets a little wider initially. The joint space becomes a little bit more narrow compared to the one on the left. And then by here, you see more symmetric joint space narrowing, but you see this big erosion, okay? And that's what ultimately leads to damage. Okay. The one on the left, <coughs> no arthritis? It was the earliest, the, the, that's when they originally presented. So they, they may have come in with, say, uh, two months of pain and swelling. Yes. Okay, but, uh, but again, early on, he asked, is this somebody that, that doesn't have arthritis on the far left? No, it's somebody that had arthritis, but they had it so early at that point, they didn't show any joint damage. And that's why we've got to the point where we're treating arth rheumatoid arthritis much more aggressively, much sooner, because what we want to do is, the paradigm used to be <coughs> that you, when people come in like this, you do physical therapy and heat and ice and aspirin and Tylenol and things like that. And then what you do is as it gets worse, then you start adding a, 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 not a full dose non steroidal full dose aspirin. You start adding hydroxychloroquine or methotrexate. Or when you get to the top, then you start using things like cytoxin or something more aggressive. And that's where, <coughs> that's where this came from because we used to have a treatment triangle. You know, we started here with the, the basic kinds of treatments, and then over time, depending upon the aggression of the disease, our treatment levels continue to, continue to rise. What we're doing now is we're flipping the pyramid, okay? <clears throat> so we're hitting it hard and fast, and then over time, trying to back off whatever we can back off of, okay? Because again, our key is, we want to drive this picture the other way. We don't want it driving this way, okay? And again, there are studies to suggest that what we do in the first two years of rheumatoid arthritis therapy is going to make a difference for how these people do 10 and 20 years down the road, okay? Again, I'm treating not only today, I'm treating tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> now here, remember I told you, between the first and second cervical levels is the only joint where there's a synovial lined um, joint, okay? And what happens is that the lining of that joint becomes inflamed, and what happens is it starts to eat away the ligaments, keeping the, the, the neck positioned, and what happens is you start to get uh, unusual movement in the, in the top of the neck. <clears throat> now the problem with this is that the spinal cord comes down from the head, down through here, okay? And what happens is that if this little post right here starts to shove backwards because you bend your head down, okay, then you start to impinge the spinal column, the spinal cord, okay. And we used to see that a lot more frequently. But with the newer advent of medicines that we have now today, it's becoming much, much uh, more, com uh, less common. Okay. So treatment. Again, we talk about the anti-inflammatory medicines. We talk about simple analgesics such as acetaminophen. We talk about corticosteroids, <clears throat> typically in this day and time. I try to talk about it as bridge therapy. I try to use prednisone early on to buy me some time while I'm waiting while some of the other longer acting medicines kick in. And when that happens, then I try to back off and see how little I can get away with getting down off the, off the prednisone. <clears throat> DMARDs stand for Disease Modifying Anti-Rheumatic Drugs. These include things like hydroxychloroquine, which is a generic name for Plaquenil methotrexate, sulfasalazine, uh, leflunamide. Okay, then we get to the biologics. We get to the anti-TNF, the Embrels, Humira's, Remicades of the world. And there's, there's like six of them now, Symphony, Simzia. Um, the anti-CD20s, um, that's rituxan or rituximab. Uh, the anti-CTLA-4 inhibitor, that's Arencia, and the IL-6 inhibitor is a Actimera. So we have a lot of choices. And what's nice about this is that these all hit different pathways in the, in the immune response, okay? So, because the immune system is very plastic. I mean, it can recognize over a, a billion different proteins. The immune system's job is to protect self from non-self, okay? It helps us protect us against bacteria, virus, cancer cells, whatever, okay? 
And so what happens is, <clears throat> if I block it this way, you know, it puts NASA to shame. If I block it with one drug, what happens is it says, okay, that may work for a while, then all of a sudden the immune system goes, okay, well, we're going to go this way. <laughs> okay, and so then we may have to change therapies. Now, that's been much more common with the traditional um, disease-modifying agents, methotrexate, et cetera. Uh, we don't see that quite as much with the biologics, and I think mainly the reason why is because it's affecting the inflammatory autoimmune pathway at a much earlier stage, and I think that's, that's part, of the, part of the reason why. And then, of course, <clears throat> sometimes um, um, if medical management fails or just, just age over time fails, then we, then we go for joint replacements. Okay. Whoop. Okay. Let me did I go back too many here. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, we'll talk about diet a little later on. It's physics, folks. That, that's all it is. I mean, people come to my office and I talk about weight, and believe me, I've never been 110 pounds. I'm never going to be 110 pounds, so I understand the struggle, okay? But <clears throat> for people with arthritis, it's just physics. The less weight you can carry, the better off you're going to be. And so I don't mean it to be, you know, people take it so personally, you know, and I, and I understand that, but it's, it's just about physics, okay? Exercise is important. My favorite thing to, to, to leave you with is the, the idea of one hour rule. The one hour rule says that pain during um, exercise is not bad. It's not necessarily good, but not, not always bad. But my idea is this. If, you're, if your pain level is here when you go to exercise, and during exercise it goes up to here, that's one thing. But an hour later, your pain level should be back down to here, okay? If it's not, then what you need to ask yourself is, <clears throat> okay, I shouldn't have done four hours of raking, okay? Yeah, yeah, y'all have done that, right? Yeah, I know, I know, okay, okay. Well, it may be raking wasn't the problem. I shouldn't have done four hours. I should have done an hour four times, okay? For example, I tell people, if you're gonna garden for three hours, garden an hour Monday, Wednesday, Friday, okay? By the end of the week, you've done the same amount of work, okay? It's just you've done it in a more joint-friendly manner, so you enjoyed the rest of the week. Because what happens is, a lot of us, I go out and work in the yard for three or four hours, and I can't move for two days, okay? So the one-hour rule says that after an hour, you reassess it, and so you ask yourself, I shouldn't have done that activity, or I shouldn't have done that much of it. Because you, know, you could be here an hour later, or you could be here an hour later. So think about it. Think about what activity you did, is it the activity, or is it I shouldn't have I should have done less of it? Okay. And we'll talk about some <coughs> adaptive aids later on. Uh, I have a, I have my own personal take on that because people really snarl at me when I mention things like uh, cane. Um, so, okay. So outcomes again, we know now really depends upon the clinical subset. There are those people with rheumatoid arthritis that's going to get a nickel's worth. Okay. There are some people with rheumatoid arthritis that's going to get the whole dollar's worth, okay? And so trying to pick out those subsets, again, things like age of onset, rheumatoid factor positivity, extra-articular manifestations, those are all things we look for to help us kind of classify people, okay, which ones do I need to be more aggressive with, and which ones can we kind of, kind of go along and see how they do, okay? Uh, disability up to 50% of 15 years. Rheumatoid arthritis patients, in my mind, are some of the world's toughest patients. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, they're tough. They, they don't complain nearly as much as I would complain. Um, and they, they put up with an amazing amount of pain. Um, and you can easily ask your surgeon. I mean, uh, most of the surgeons I deal with, you know, they say, okay, I, you know, this rheumatoid arthritis patient, I hardly have to give them any pain medicines at all because they, they just deal with it differently. Okay, so people with rheumatoid arthritis are, are, are definitely tough people. Um, and as a result, I mean, usually my patients with rheumatoid arthritis, it's, you know, I'm the one bringing up, well, maybe this is a time to consider cutting back or retiring or maybe even seeking disability. And that's when they look at me like I have antenna growing out of my head, okay? So because that's just not in their mindset of what they're going to do, okay? Um, the mortality issue, we talked about, I talked about that briefly. There was a very encouraging study just released within the last year that suggests that we're making inroads in that, that the new biologic agents are actually improving lifespan in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. 
So, <clears throat> very encouraging. And again, depends upon the severity of the disease. Okay. So 2014 and beyond, what are we going to do? I think we're going to see more genetic testing. I think we're going to be able to, I think, you know, in 10 years, you're going to come into my office, and a new patient with rheumatoid arthritis, we're going to draw your blood, we're going to be able to do genetic testing, and say, okay, you fall into this category. You have a mild disease category, that's the way we're going to treat you. Or you fall into this category of a severe disease category, and we're going after it. Okay, which is going to be great because I think it's, what it's going to do is it's going to minimize side effects because we're not going to be treating everybody the same way. And that's going to be very exciting. My only concern about that is the insurance companies because suppose you apply for insurance or long-term disability. Oh, you have rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, well, let me check this blood test. Okay, well, guess who's not going to get long-term disability? Okay, so uh, that, that we're going to have to be careful with. Um, we're going to be seeing different combinations of drugs, new biologic agents. We've been doing clinical research in our office since the mid-70s. Most of the medicines that you recognize that are on the market today have been tested first in our office. Uh, some of them, in Braille, we first started testing when it was still a number. Didn't even have a name yet. And so, um, and you know, these are, these are altruistic patients that are saying, yes, I want to do something for my arthritis, but I want to make it better for my children and my grandchildren. And, and, and my neighbors, you know. So it's, it's very exciting. So we did that initially because um, before pre-1990, we ran out of options for people. And so we started doing research just to give our patients more options, okay? And now it's been a, a dramatic, a dramatic uh, boon to everybody in the country. Uh, again, because of the kindness of our patients, okay. Okay, osteoarthritis. Okay, here, then we're going to flip to the other side of the coin. <clears throat> and I hate to say it, but it's the best way to look at it. It's a mechanical wear and tear kind of process. Okay, now all of my colleagues that do bench research and stuff like that are now throwing arrows at me because when you delve down into the microscopic level of the joint, looking at all the different things, there is an inflammatory response going on in the joint. Okay. It's just not the same kind of inflammatory response in the sense that it doesn't cause body-wide inflammation. It doesn't cause extra articular symptoms like we talked about with rheumatoid disease, okay? It doesn't cause your sedimentation rate to go up, okay? This is localized inflammation into the specific joint, okay? And what you see is you see wear and tear. And the most common things you look at, and this is really an important list right here, um, there's, there's a lot of discussion about tobacco. There are some people that believe that tobacco increases your risk for osteoarthritis because of negative effects on cartilage metabolism, okay? But if you look at the literature, you can find just the same number of studies that go, no, nah, it's, it's, that's not a problem, okay? But, but the other, the, the top three, no question about it. And actually, probably more importantly, the fourth one, weight. Again, we talked about before, it's physics, okay? But the thing I point out to you is in that whole list, I mean, taking, taking tobacco out of it, because we, we, we said it's kind of iffy, okay? But if you take tobacco out of it, the only thing that you have any control over as a patient is your weight. You don't have any effect about how old you get, what you inherited from your parents, okay? And for most instances, the degree of trauma, okay? Um, so you have to, have to think about that. Uh, yes, right here. See, see the whiteness here? The medial part or the inside part of the knee? Uh, you see that whiteness and you see that gap right here? Okay? Uh, you have a little bit of cartilage left, but right here the gap is gone and that's what they refer to as bone on bone. And that, means that, means, that means pain, that means the cartilage is gone. Now people tend to, tend to notice that, especially when with what we refer to as transfers of position, getting up and out of chairs, uh, up and off the toilet, up and down stairs those kinds of things. And slopes are tricky. People love to walk these days, and I really admire that. Flat, paved ground, okay? Because slopes, hills, okay, to the knee, that's just like a stair, okay? So flat, paved ground. Uh, people like to walk on gravel roads because it's just right outside the door, and I understand that. The problem is the gravel gives you this kind of micro movement of the knee joint, you know? The, the gravel gives way just a little bit, not much, just a little, okay? The problem is it's, it's doing this to the knee, 
Okay. So flat paved ground. Okay. Is it possible to have both? Yeah, both. both. Oh, yes. The question was, can you have both diseases? Can you have rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis? By all means. Yeah. You know, for, for example, you know, maybe uh, somebody gets a rheumatoid arthritis at age 35 or 40, and then 20 years later, you know, the, the old football knee gives out them, and, you know, they have more mechanical wear and tear of the knee. Okay. So, yes, you can have both. <clears throat> okay. So, the definition here, unlike rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune inflammatory condition, this is basically a mechanical failure of the cartilage. Okay. Usually, age 50 or higher. There's a half a million new hips and knees put in every year uh, for this condition. It's mechanical, but it's also biochemical, and I referred to that easily uh, earlier on. The main indication for surgery is pain relief, not improving function. Okay? So think about that, especially when you talk about shoulder replacement or whatever like that. You're not talking about trying to improve your shoulder range of motion. You're, trying about, you're talking about trying to relieve pain, especially nighttime pain. Okay. Treatment. Weight loss, exercise. We talked about the things before. Analgesics, Tylenol, big Tylenol fan. Uh, I, I just can't believe everything you read, you know. Tylenol is still the safest drug out there, okay? Now, if you abuse Tylenol, meaning that you take more than the recommended amount, yes, you can get into trouble. One of the biggest studies about 10 years ago, a big deal about uh, Tylenol causing liver damage. What the news didn't tell you was that most of those people were drinking to excess. So if you poison your liver and you abuse Tylenol, are you going to have a liver problem? Yes. Okay. So, and we needed a study to tell us that, by the way. They have lowered it. The new recommended dose, for maximum dose of Tylenol is 1,000 milligrams, which is two extra strength, three times a day. Okay. And, uh, and oftentimes, I'll use it in combination with a non -steroidal. I'll say, okay, take your naproxen in the morning, and then towards the afternoon, take your Tylenol. I mean, maybe we can, because the, the things with the non is the risk for bothering your kidney or liver function, or cause, or, or for a lot of people, gastrointestinal disease, peptic ulcer disease. Okay. Okay. And then we talk about the steroid injections or the visco supplementation, Synvisc. Uh, there's a lot of interest now in the term chondro protection. Chondro means cartilage and protection. So they're talking about using some medicines to try to do that. Jury's still out on it. We'll see what happens. You know, some people are doing stem cell or fat cell uh, injections into the knee joints and stuff like that. Um, it's $3,500. It's done, not covered by insurance. I, we don't do it here in our office because there's just no data at right now to suggest that that's the way to go. But there are places in town that are doing those kinds of things. Uh, and then surgery. Uh, again, outcome, no effect on mortality. Okay. So here's classically osteoarthritis. Now, in contrast to the rheumatoid patient, it loves the DIP joints, the distal interphalangeal joints. And this is not soft tissue swelling. These are not rheumatoid nozzles. This is just... This is hard bony change, okay? There's no soft tissue perception to that. That's just rock hard, okay? It loves these joints. It loves these joints. It almost never involves these. Again, almost, okay? But like rheumatoid loves this, loves this, leaves this alone. It's the flip, okay? The other thing is that osteoarthritis loves the base of the thumb, especially in the dominant hand, whatever that may be for you. Osteoarthritis. osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis loves these and the base of the thumb. Okay. And then you were talking about before, here's the bone on bone. We talked about cartilage space here, bone on bone there. <coughs> usually the dominant hand first. Not always, but usually. Mm -hmm. But eventually over time, it does become more symmetrical, just depending on how hard you use your hands. Okay. So treatment, where are we at? Okay, preventing disease. I, we're way away from that. Okay, so um, I think we'll have to wait and see where that, that leads us. What we're looking into now is the idea of chondro protection. This one's the one that intrigued me. There have been some recent studies just in the last few years to su suggest that Imbrel, uh, one of the anti-TNF agents, is not effective for the treatment of osteoarthritis. So I think we're pretty much done with the anti-TNFs. We'll look at some others. My, my concern about the biologics is that the risk-benefit ratio. 
um, you know, are we, are we trying to accept too much risk with a biologic for the treatment of osteoarthritis? This is interesting. The MMPIs are the metalloproteinase inhibitors. Uh, there's been some interesting look at uh, these, these medicines that can reduce inflammatory response. And we've seen that in several antibiotic studies. Tetracycline is an MMPI, or minocycline, doxycycline, can actually reduce inflammatory response. That's why with certain antibiotics, some patients with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis actually feel better on the antibiotic, okay? Not because of the antibiotic, but because of its anti-inflammatory capability, okay? So a lot of interest in that right now. Uh, other treatments, we talked about the non um, physical therapy, exercise. Um, I really love water. Water is a great exercise for knees. When you're chest high in water, you're only 25% weight bearing. Okay, so it's a great knee exercise uh, re regimen. And believe me, if you don't think you can get a workout in water, chest high water, you're not doing it hard enough. Okay, so I mean, you, you can you can lose weight doing a water exercise program. Okay. Um, um, Analgesics, braces, splints, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Again, weight loss. And then joint replacement when, when needed. Okay. Uh, come on. There you go. Okay. This is always the key. I mean, what do we want for tomorrow? I want a safer non steroidal You know, originally you, you heard the issue with Vioxx years ago. Vioxx came out, probably the best non steroidal drug of my generation. Okay, great drug. Uh, if it were to come back on the market tomorrow, I wouldn't have enough phones to answer. I mean, that's how people feel about Vioxx, okay? Merck, however, tried to play a shell game with the FDA and hide some of the results on cardiovascular risk. And so they basically gave the Vioxx the death penalty. They just said, you're, it's done, you're off the market, okay? We only have one COX-2 inhibitor left, and that's Celebrex. Um, but since then, all of the non steroidal anti inflammatories, ibuprofen, Aleve, all of them, all carry the same cardiovascular risk warning. Now, there's been some studies to, to suggest that naproxen may be a little bit safer from a heart standpoint, um, <clears throat> but, but everybody has to take that into condition. What I usually tell my patients that have cardiac disease, if, if there's a real concern, then take a baby aspirin, 81 milligrams, one hour before your non steroidal dose. Okay? You just need one baby aspirin a day. Um, the first time, the, I, I did have a patient on Vioxx one time. She was 85. She had a, a TIA, a mini stroke. And so this, the news broke, and I thought, oh, my goodness. And, and I called her, and I said, you've got to come in. We've got to talk about this. We've got to get you off your medicine. And so she sat there very patiently in my office, and I went through my 15-minute spiel about what the FDA found and so on and so forth. And she looked at me, and I got done. I said, well, what do you think? And she reaches over, she pats me on the thigh, and she goes, honey, I'm 85, and I, I want to keep moving, and this drug is just fine for me. And that was her choice, but I figured at that point she had informed consent. I mean, she, I, I laid it all out for her, and she decided that's what she wanted to do. But of course, about a month later, they took it off the market, and that was the end of that. Um, and then she was mad. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife hoarded her supply of 30 tablets for almost a year. You know, so um, anyway. Again, no such thing as a perfect drug, and I'm not sitting here to tell you that the drugs are without potential side effects. But again, as with anything, as you know, with any drug, whether it's a heart drug or, a, or an arthritis drug, okay, you always want to look at what is the relative benefit versus the relative risk, okay? And then you make your decision. Nutraceuticals. I was a very big anti-glucosamine uh, warrior when it first came out because I thought, okay, here's just another thing coming down the pipe that trying to pry money out of people's pockets. However, there were some very interesting studies that came out of Europe looking at glucosamine sulfate. And, and specifically with glucosamine, what was interesting about it was um, they were actually seeing in peer-reviewed articles and, you know, being reviewed by, by physicians and others, they were actually seeing a positive response. About half the patients that took glucosamine saw a benefit, about half didn't. Now there was about a 25% placebo response, meaning if you gave somebody a sugar pill and says, here, this is gonna help, 25% of people go, oh, okay, that worked really great, okay? But still, there was, a, there was a statistically significant difference. 
we've never really been able to reproduce that in this country, those, those responses. And, I, and the, the gurus that talk about this is that most of the glucosamine in this country is glucosamine hydrochloride, not glucosamine sulfate, okay? The reason why is because hydrochloride glucosamine is cheaper to make and has a longer shelf life, okay? In this country, glucosamine is an over-the-counter. It's, it's not a drug. The FDA considers it a food supplement, okay? So it's not regulated by the FDA. The glucosamine studies in Europe, in Europe, glucosamine sulfate is a prescription drug, and it's made by pharmaceutical houses, okay? So very, very different. I think that's probably the difference there. Again, I think over time we're going to find more interest in looking at this issue of regeneration. <clears throat> Again, we're not there yet, but it'll be interesting to see where that happens. Exercise is important. The muscles around the joint help protect the joint. The knee is the largest joint in the body, and inherently it's the least stable. And so the muscles around the joint help keep the knee stable and strong. Okay. And then, of course, better joint replacements. Okay. So treatment options. Okay. <clears throat> The thing I try to recommend to people, and one of the things I, I talk about a lot is, if I can, for osteoarthritis, again, unlike rheumatoid disease, which is an erosive, destructive disease over time that can not only affect your ability to function, but also your life, um, osteoarthritis is a wear and tear kind of process. Yes, it does, if, uh, does affect your life as far as making you adapt to things, but um, but it's not like if I give you a medicine and you take this medicine every day for 10 years for the treatment of your osteoarthritis, I'm going to influence the outcome of that joint, okay? The osteoarthritis pattern is going to do what it's going to do, okay? The medicine is just there to treat the symptoms, okay? So what I tell people is if you're using a non well, instead of using it seven days a week, maybe let's try using it five days a week, okay? I mean, less medicine is less medicine, okay? We want to do that without losing benefit, but at the same time, use less medicine. The other thing I try to do is I try to really get them to, to buy into the idea of non-pharmacologic management. Pacing their daily activities, the one-hour rule, uh, appropriate exercise, and that's it, <coughs> is that pacing your daily activities doesn't mean you don't get to exercise. You do get to exercise, you just have to exercise smart, okay? Heat and ice modalities, uh, resistance training, uh, which is helpful. Aerobic conditioning, again, water's a great place. It's remarkably aerobic if you do it right. Um, and in this, this way I'm going to talk about, we'll talk about, there's another slide here that talks about canes, but we'll talk about it here. I love canes. I think canes are one of the greatest things. Um, um, I, like, I like walkers. Um, and the reason is, some people come to my office and they go, I don't want to use a cane. I don't want to use a walker. I, I don't want to feel limited. Okay. Well. If you think about it, it's just the opposite. A cane and a walker doesn't limit you. It gives you the ability to function, the ability to do things, to go out and, and be a part of society. And so I, I think that's a big issue for people is to get the mindset different is that the cane and the walker is not a limitation. It's an enabler. You know, how do I get out? How do I do more? Okay. Okay. The take home here is two. This one right here. For every pound you lose, you take three to five pounds of stress off your knee. If you lose 10 pounds, you unload 30 to 50 pounds of stress off your knee. Now, <clears throat> if I lost 10 pounds tomorrow, am I going to notice that on my knees the next day? No, but on the next month, in the next year, I'm going to notice that. Okay? And you magnify that by a greater weight loss. You know? What I encourage my patients to do is because they say, well, gee, I'm 100 pounds overweight. This is like a drop in the bucket. Okay, but it's a nice bucket. I mean, let's, you know, okay, we're not going to lose 100 pounds. We're going to lose 10 pounds, okay? And the next office visit, we're going to lose another 10 pounds, okay? And then over time, it just, you, you bite it off in little chunks, you know? Um, <laughs> it's not for wimps, though. It's very tough, okay? So, um, um, I, very basic, you know, people say, well, what kind of diet? You know, some people really like the Mediterranean diet, really favored by the Mayo Clinic because it's anti-inflammatory capabilities, and I think that's really pretty awesome as well. Um, but I think just, you know, the basic four food groups. For a lot of people, it's portion control. A lot of people, it's not eating out of a window. Um, you know, it's, um, 
you know, instead of drinking six beers a night, you know, let's cut it down to one beer a night, okay? Um, you know, different, different things like that. So, because what you want to do is you want to make a lifestyle change. And uh, one of the fastest growing departments in the Mayo Clinic, the staunch, conservative, ivory tower of the Mayo Clinic, is the Division of Alternative and Contemporary Medicine. And, and I, I got to hear the speakers there. They had a very interesting talk. And, and their philosophy is that food is medicine, okay? And that supplements are to supplement what you don't get in your food. And I thought, that's brilliant. You know, because some people come in, they have a list of like 20 supplements. And I'm going, yeah, but what are you eating? You know, <laughs> I mean, so, so think about that when you make your own choices. Um, you know, how, how can I adjust my diet to get what I need in my diet and go from there? There are some anti-inflammatory kinds of foods. Fish oil, great anti-inflammatory. Uh, turmeric, uh, it's what makes curry curry in Indian food. Uh, very good anti-inflammatory. Um, ginkgo biloba to some degree, also good for the memory. Uh, so you remember where you put your fish oil and your, and your, uh, your other things, turmeric, so, okay. Um, again, exercise very important. Um, this study really suggests that it really probably doesn't matter what kind of exercise you get as long as you get some other kind of exercise. And really for most people, the best exercise is just walking, okay? Doesn't have to be expensive, you know, just get out and walk, okay? And, um, and here's a, the key there is that when you couple exercise to diet, you lose four times as much weight. Because most people will say, I diet, I diet, I don't eat anything. The problem is, when you diet, you get in, your body goes into a starvation mode. It says, gee, you're not giving me any food, so I've got, to, I've got to decrease my metabolism. And so what the exercise does is it keeps the metabolism revved up so that you get this negative balance. You're burning energy, and you're taking less calories, and it's got to come from somewhere, and that's where the fat comes off. Okay. Um, topicals, um, you've seen them all. There's a, there's a jillion of them. Um, capsaicin is probably one of the most common ones used, uh, this here. Capsaicin is a, a, a medicine that inhibits substance P, which is a neurotransmitter for pain. Um, the thing to remember about that is capsaicin is the thing that makes jalapenos hot, okay? So when you put it on your, when you put it on your finger right here, you don't want to do that. That's not good. Or you don't want to go to the bathroom and touch other parts that don't need to be touched with that stuff. So. Um, remember, if you get in trouble, milk is, is handy for that. Okay. So you can't get this just anywhere, right? Okay. So again, that's my, that's my promotion for, for the independent stick, is one of my partner's calls, and I thought, that's really lame. Just tell them what it is. It's a nice cane. Yeah. How about walking sticks? I love walking sticks. Yeah, any, any, anything that you can use. The, the problem sometimes with walking sticks, though, is that it's more of a balance or more of a guidance. Uh, traditionally, uh, canes are best when they're when they're used together in the in the gait. Okay, I hope you all can kind of see this. Um, one of the problems, um, you know, people do the Gabby Hayes kind of imitation, kind of like you know, kind of like that. No, the cane goes in the opposite knee, opposite hand of the of the knee. So, so for example, if your left knee is bothering you, you use it in your right hand. Why is that? Is because at some point in your gait, you're walking. Okay. Your, your bad knee is on the ground, okay? And your good knee is coming through to step through, okay? So you're bearing all your weight on your left knee. So you want the cane in the right hand, okay? To help counterbalance the weight of the bad knee onto the good hand, okay? And then once you step through again, okay, your bad knee's off the ground, then you, then you move your cane with it to step down again, okay? Because you don't need to protect your good knee, you need to protect your bad knee. Um, stairs with a bad knee. Um, easy thing to remember, when you have a bad knee and you're going up and down stairs, okay, the good knee goes up, the bad knee goes down. The bad knee goes to the bad place. And the good knee goes up to the good place, okay? So when you're stepping down, step down with the bad knee. And when you're going up, step up with a good knee. Okay. Oh, the other thing about a cane <coughs> is kind of the walking stick kind of issue is when you stand in military position, okay, the top of the cane should hit you at the wrist. So that when, you, when, you, when you're grabbing the cane, you kind of hike up your elbow about 20%, a 20 degree bend, okay? 
So when you're sitting in a military position, the, cane, the top of the cane should hit you at the wrist. Okay. okay. Um, braces. For the most part, um, it's more of a symptomatic thing. You can get braces that cost hundreds or even thousands of dollars. Most of it is just support and comfort. <clears throat> They've even found that with football players that, that you know, they wear knee braces, but there's still a lot of question about how much benefit it actually has when you actually have a 300 pound guy hit your knee with a brace on it. Um, so, so any kind of brace really seems to be better. Okay. You know, expectations, okay, it's, it's not a normal joint, okay? And what I, what I just try to encourage people to remember is, again, pace yourself, okay? You, you know, you don't need to run the half marathon. I still don't get that, but, um, so, I mean, to run that far, somebody should be chasing you with a gun. Okay. So, and again, communication is really important. You know, your spouse needs to understand, because the problem is, People can't see your pain, okay? And, uh, and at the same time, you don't want to be broadcasting, oh my, you know, you know, I have all this pain and whatever like that. But, but to the people you love, they, they, need to, they need to know what you're going through, okay? Um, okay. And there's a lot of different things. Again, not everything is fixed with a pill, okay? There are a lot of different things. Um, certainly, um, con contrary to to you know, what's in the medical literature or, or in, into the responses to the medical literature, I will say, is that uh, prayer has a big effect on people and their faith life. So that's something really important. Social support is very important as well. Um, sometimes support groups are great. You have to be careful. Sometimes support groups are just wine sessions. So you, you want to be careful that you just surround yourself with the right kind of people. Um, chiropractic does help some people. Um, again, it just depends on the situation. I'm not anti-chiropractic. I just, you know, I think they're good chiropractors, good chiropractors and bad chiropractors, just like they're good and bad doctors. You just got to find the right one. Okay. Acupuncture is really interesting. It's, real, it's really for a lot of people, and I will say a lot of people, but for a certain subset of patients, uh, acupuncture can be real helpful. Uh, it's not covered by most insurances, uh, but usually within two or three sessions, you'll have an idea whether or not it's going to benefit you. Okay. Um, the over-the-counters, again, you know, read, read the, the products insert about how much you use. You know, if you start using, um, you know, the anti-inflammatories, you got to be careful if you're on a blood thinner. You got to watch out for peptic ulcer disease. I, I think if you're using a non steroidal on your own, I would limit it to a couple of weeks without, you know, letting your doctor know what's, what's going on. Okay, let them help you make the decisions about what's the safest way to go about treating your discomfort. And just remember, there are drug interactions, but ab above all, Tylenol is about the safest. Okay. Um, expense. My thought on my thought on narcotics, and it talks about here about NSAIDs and opiates. I really try to keep my patients off of narcotics because I, I do firmly believe it's a slippery slope. Um, you know, if they are on narcotics, typically they're only on two or three a day, two or three tablets a day, because the problem is, if people rely on them just for every little whim or every little hurt, all of a sudden two tablets becomes four tablets, and four tablets becomes eight tablets, and before you know it, somebody's hooked. Okay. My my thought about non steroidals or about osteoarthritis is that if you really get to the point where you need chronic narcotic analgesic therapy every day, you should be looking at surgery. Let's fix the problem, okay? Now, there are some people, I mean, if you're, if you're 90 years old and you have a bad heart and, you know, surgery is not an option, then, then you do what you got to do. Okay. Um, you yeah, know, let's get back. Okay. Steroids, very, very popular. There have been several studies suggesting that intraarticular corticosteroid injection therapy of the knees or, or whatever are not effective. I beg to differ. I mean, you know, usually I have to talk somebody into getting their first knee injection, then after that they call me, you know. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's where the evidence is. Um, again, it's not a fix, it's not a cure, but for a lot of people, buys them some time, wards off uh, surgery for a while, okay. Um, okay. 
Uh, joint replacements. <clears throat> Here's a hip joint replacement here. Okay. Again, can be very effective. Um, uh, hips are hip. When people people walk on a bad knee for a long time, they don't walk on a bad hip for a long time. I mean, it really. When hips go, they go fast as far as people's tolerance of what they're going to put up with. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The miracle cure. Studies have suggested with this, there's 20% decreased risk of breast cancer, 30% less heart disease, 50% less diabetes, interestingly, 13% less Alzheimer's, uh, less male impotence, fewer strokes, longer life, less depression, and we know what that is, right? Yeah. Okay. It's walking. Okay. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to go to a gym. You don't, I mean, just walk. Okay. And in this particular study, they were doing one hour of walking three to seven days a week. It didn't have to be seven days a week. It would just be three days a week. Uh, Ken Cooper is a very famous uh, exercise physiologist and physician in Dallas, Texas. And um, he has some staggering numbers on, on the health benefits of exercise in, in treating his patients. One of his devotees is George Bush, the, youngest pres the younger president. He was a big fan of uh, uh, Ken Cooper's uh, methods. And, you know, every year the president goes to um, uh, Bethesda to get their annual physical. The first year he went, they couldn't test him cardiovascularly because his exercise routine was too vigorous. They couldn't, they couldn't max him out on a treadmill. So they had to fly Ken Cooper and his team in from Dallas with their own treadmill protocol just to get him anywhere near his maximum heart rate. So, you know, exercise does a lot. It's amazing. And he said he, uh, President Bush said he used exercise to, to ward off stress. <laughs> Can you imagine that stress? Wow. Okay. Amazing thing about, our, uh, about presidents is pictures, you ever see them when they go into office and when they come out of office? <laughs> Different people. I was in uh, Washington, D.C. about 10 years ago. I went to the National Art Museum. And they had these live.